I guess, first of all, I want to know what the the impetus was to make this. Well, we started off with the intention of making a small movie. I had just had another movie fall apart, um, an experience which I've, which I've had all too many times. And it was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back, and I decided that I wanted to make something that was small enough that I could control and make sure that it wouldn't fall apart. And so in discussing that with Julian, we started to talk about a dinner party, and we wanted to do something about a character who was not who she presented herself as. And bit by bit, that led to you know the idea of a man looking across the room and seeing someone he thinks he recognizes, but who isn't her, um, which then led to the film that you saw. Um, you know, thematically, I think I've always been interested in identity, and you know, like many people, I you know harbor the fantasy of of um, going off and leaving everything behind and wiping the slate clean and starting something completely new. And um, and so I was just interested in exploring what that would really be like. And more fascinatingly, what it would be like to do it repeatedly. And, you know, if you've done it once and then it doesn't work out, what do you do? Do you go back to the first person that you were? Do you stick it out? Or do you start all over again? And how many times can you do that before you're screwed? Yeah. Well, when you were <clears throat> when you were putting this together and discussing it with your actors, did you form an idea in your mind if this way of living for her was... Um, instructive or destructive? I think, you know, it's funny. We we vacillated between those two positions. For me, I always felt that it was a little bit of both. I think Rachel at times really questioned her character and at other times would do a scene and suddenly see her own character from a different angle and and embrace her and see what she was doing as liberating and completely freeing and, and in some respects um, radically inclusive and, and sort of embracing everyone that she met because she viewed all, you know, it was a character who was fascinated by and viewed all walks of life as, as, as inherently interesting. So she went back and forth, I think. And, and for me, it was, you know, I, I don't fall on to one side or the other of the, the question. I think that's what makes it an interesting question for a movie. It's a little, it's, it's yeah. both things at the same time. Yeah, I think so too. But I would imagine that with this kind of role in particular, that um, Rachel probably had a lot of conversations with you about the character because to figure out exactly what the truth of her was because uh, enigmatic is not necessarily something that you can play. <laughs> right. Well, it was, it, you know, yeah, it was a lot of, it was a lot of conversations and it was a, it was a constant conversation. Um, she leaned over to me last night at the premiere and said, I, I, I still don't know who this woman is, you know, in the sense that mm. she is very slippery. She's very hard to get, a read on. We did come up with an extensive backstory for who she was born as and what it was about that existence uh, and her family relationships that caused her to bolt from her past. Um, but it's such an extraordinary thing that it's hard to pin down. And, and in fact, we made a choice in the movie not to try and reduce it to you know some early childhood trauma mm -hmm. that would pretend to justify everything that she's done. Cause I don't think it can be explained that easily. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't think people realize when they, when they watch a lot of movies nowadays, most of the scenes in movies uh, don't even last a minute. Um, and you know, you, you kind of take that for granted until you watch a movie like yours where scenes are allowed to breathe I mean, you have some lengthy scenes in here, especially a, a dinner table scene and a, and a scene with uh, Kathy Bates and Danny Glover, uh, who are also magnificent in the movie. Did, did you have time to rehearse and almost workshop those scenes with your actors? 
We didn't, and and that was originally the intention of the way we were going to make the movie. Um, we had some rehearsal, and and I definitely had a lot of conversation with Rachel um, beforehand about the character. And then she and Mike Chen and I met, and we would read scenes um, and discuss them. As far as getting the group scenes on their feet, though, we. I, I did something that I hadn't done before just because I only had like one three hour rehearsal for the 40 minutes of the movie that takes place in the house, which was that we basically improvise straight through everything that happens in the house, um, sort of from memory, kind of with a, a general memory of what they had read in the script. So that just enabled everyone to, to break the seal on every scene and at least feel like they had set it out loud on its feet in the actual house once. But then we really had to figure things out as we went along while we were shooting. Yeah. You know, thinking about the uh, the theme of, of this movie, or one of the themes anyway, and, and looking at your, your other work, you seem to have um, an, a real interest in kind of the, the reinvention of identity. Uh, and I'm wondering if you're you're aware that that's something you're drawn to or if I'm completely wrong? No, no, you're totally right. And um, I was just actually writing about it for someone else, but, you know, we always refer to Maria Paul Grace as as being at its its most fundamental a story about a girl who's searching for her place in the world. Um, And similarly, Forgiveness of Blood is about a kid or, or two kids who are, trying to negotiate their place in the world, that they're trying to just be teenagers, modern teenagers, but they're stuck in a culture that defines them differently um, as as defines them by their last name and their blood heritage and thus as targets in a blood feud, even though they would prefer to define themselves differently or free themselves of that. So, yeah, so identity, how, how you try and assert yourself it's, it's a very broad term, so it starts to maybe be a little bit meaningless, but, you know, it's, it's about, there are films about characters who are trying to assert their place in the world often times against the way people categorize them or pigeonhole them or place them. Yeah, and that's something that... Um correct me if I'm wrong, that, that your next movie deals with too, doesn't it, to some extent? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, if I didn't know better, I'd swear that you had just read this piece that I just wrote. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is. It is. It is. About, you know, we talk a lot in film about a character arc, um, and and it gets to be a little bit glib and shorthanded, especially because sometimes it feels like we're doing things, we're creating a an, an arc for a character that is more apt to exist on screen in a sort of fairy tale way than it ever does in reality. And one of the things about the film that I'm about to do is that it's about a guy who, when I met him, I realized had in actual real life made more of a change in his identity than anyone I've ever actually met. You know, he went from being a right-wing conservative Pentecostal preacher who believed in fire, the fire and brimstone of hell and, and ultimate judgment to someone who believes that hell doesn't exist and that everyone is loved by God and saved already and is left-wing now and has married various gay couples and preaches to an entirely different set of congregants. Um, and have a whole different identity. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I got to ask you. The new movie uh, is, is falls, falls into line with that. I, I got to ask you, it, has it dawned on you yet that, uh, my God, I'm, I'm about to direct Robert Redford? I mean, how does that feel? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very excited about it. I'm equally excited about, about all the rest of the cast as well. Um, and, and and part of the excitement of, of of directing those actors is knowing that it's meaty material 
and that it's going to be hopefully fun to engage with them and just really dig into the work. Um, so it's, it's less about being starstruck, although certainly there's an element of that, and more about being able to do, you know, the best possible work with the best possible collaborators. And that's mm-hmm. very exciting. Well, well, before I let you go, this is my last question for you. I did read a piece from you, and I don't know how uh, – I don't remember where it was or how recent it was. But when, when you think about the director's job – um, and the actor, you're entering different worlds. Uh, you're, you're taking on and empathizing with different identities. So do you see a movie like Complete Unknown as an allegory for filmmaking itself? We, it, was, it was almost startling, the number of actors who came into audition for the supporting cast who would sit down and say, you realize that you've written a screenplay about what it is that we do as actors. Um, and the first time it happened, I was like, oh, yeah, uh, actually, I guess that's right. I hadn't really thought of it in those terms. I think it's not a coincidence. I mean, I think the actors go into doing what they do for reasons similar to why I went into filmmaking, which is, you know, just this love of entering into, of, of role playing and of entering into different worlds and learning about different worlds and doing research and playing anthropologist, um, Mm-hmm. And this film, this film was was born out of a, I think I mentioned out of a frustration of other other movies falling apart, and it wasn't just a, a, a logistical frustration in terms of budget level and whatnot. It was also the frustration of of the length of time that results in between the projects. And so there's, you know, as I'm sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring for you know the green light, there's a desire to be out in the world and having more experiences and adventures. And that I think is what led to the fantasy of this character who does that to the extreme. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it, it has a, a definite connection to what I do as a filmmaker and what actors do as well. It's interesting how, how you say that it didn't dawn on you that this might be an allegory in that direction, but it reminds me of something that, uh, Cronenberg said years ago that he doesn't quite know why he wants to make something, and, and that's he, he tries to figure that out as as he's making it. In effect, he makes a movie to figure out why he's making it. D- does that ring true right. at all to you at all? Yeah, for sure. Definitely, what happens. I mean, you may. I don't know that you have no idea when you start. Certainly, you have to pretend you know why. I, I literally had an, a call this morning with an actress about this next project, and she she said, "Why do you want to make this film?" And I, you have to have an answer ready to go because you need to convince people of your passion for the subject because that's what fires people up. But there's no question that as you go along, hopefully, you make discoveries um, that lead to a different perspective on the material and that help you to understand what it is that you're making and suddenly in that you realize um, differently why you are making what you're making. Um, yeah. You know, ideally the filmmaking process is a process of continual discovery and exploration. Mm-hmm. That undoubtedly is, is the richest and most enjoyable version of getting to make movies. <laughs> 